Got science, we got maths, you're staying up to class. Everything in this world is made up of matter, matter, matter. <laughs>
that was Never Forget You by The Noisettes. So we thought we'd start our first show of the year by introducing ourselves, your radio team, just while Lily drags herself into the studio. I'm Polly. Um, I've been working as a doctor for two years and I'm especially interested in health inequalities, gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health. So I apologise in advance for the sex talk this year. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I have always been into drama and so SciComm is an amazing way to bring my creativity and medicine together. Of course, the live arts industry is struggling at the moment, so we'll have to see where I can go with that. In the meantime, documentaries and spoof music videos about sexual health are my remit. More on that later in the year, I promise. <laughs> Lily, over to you. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm also a SciComm student here. Uh, my background is in archaeological science. I specialised in osteoarchaeology, which is the study of human remains. I did my dissertation looking into the skeletal evidence for domestic violence against women in medieval England. So Ooh. this kind of gender-based violence, it's not a particularly happy topic, but I'm sure it's going to be something we're, me and my me and Polly are going to be chatting about. I got into SciComm because honestly, I just want to do Horrible Histories TV show, but for <laughs> science, that's my goal. And you, you know, you know, like the, the skeleton song, the bone song, like oh, you yeah. had bones connected to the, I want to do that, but accurately. There's going to be like, 24 lines of just your vertebrae <laughs> that will make it work somehow. That sounds amazing. I love Horrible Histories. Um, I cannot wait to hear that song. I'm not quite sure if even I could do that, um, despite having a, a clinical background. Um, but I guess, we, you know, we've got to find where we um, overlap in terms of our interests and things. So that's exactly. exciting. We'll make it work somehow. <laughs> So um, that's right. So I'm I'm the radio editor, and Lily's our wonderful producer. So she's running back to be behind the soundboard now after I've forced her to come in here. <laughs> we'll um, definitely be looking at our various interests uh, throughout the year. Now for another song. This is "Truth Hurts" by Lizzo, who I absolutely love.
That was the amazing Lizzo. Can you tell my bias to the song choices out of who chose which songs? Um, Before we move on to our next segment, I can see that there's five people watching live, which is very exciting. Um, And the YouTube chat is there and ready to be used. So if you'd like a shout out on the radio or have got any questions or comments, please throw them in the chat and I'll be keeping an eye on it throughout this segment. So... Earlier this week, we spoke to Manny, a final year medical student at Manchester University, about his experiences as a black medical student and reflections on black history in medicine. The first question I wanted to ask you is when I mention um, black history and black experiences in medicine, what kind of comes to mind for you? Um, I tend to split into both. Uh, So the history, I tend to go all the way back and think about black people in terms of medical discoveries, in terms of testing new things, new drugs, like the cases with syphilis. But then when I think about the other part, I think experience in terms of me, my cohort, other black students I know studying medicine around the country and the kind of stuff they've dealt with in terms of in hospital and out. Yeah, there's a a lot to unpick there, I think. We mentioned the syphilis study, the Tuskegee. I think those kind of experiments that were carried out, so yeah, essentially black people given syphilis and then just not treated and just kind of monitored for the effects. Inhumane practices that were performed, a lot of of surgical experiments were performed on women without anaesthetic, they were used just essentially as lab rats, guinea pigs. And I think when it comes to current day practices, I know people say don't harp too much on the past, but it's kind of an awareness of where the science has come from. And I think with a disconnect of understanding of the kind of conditions that Black people had been subjected to in terms of medical practice and the points used to validate the treatment and back it up, such as, oh, they don't feel pain, have actually continued to current modern day. Like it's not even too much of a stretch to look at everything happening in American hospitals and the female mortality at, um, when it comes to giving birth, that you think, why are people not being taken seriously? And I've even had it to a very personal experience of that exact thing, people not taking pain seriously in a black woman I know. And that was almost, yeah, that was almost fail for her. Yeah, I think the other thing to highlight is that some of that research, you know, the syphilis study was only in the 1900s that that happened. And that's, you know, not that long ago at all. And I, I think the the pain thing is is very interesting, as you said, about um, mortality and childbirth. You know, the Embrace report found last year that black women were five times as likely to die in childbirth than white women. And it's just it's completely shocking but tragically with the complexities of institutionalized racism actually not that surprising so Manny you mentioned a study about pain in black people could you tell me a bit more about that um yeah so there was a 2016 study I saw that was in America and it was about the medical student's perception of black people and their perception of pain and it found that 40 percent of these students thought that black people had thicker skin or they had less nerves, so was less able to feel pain. So they believed it was a kind of structural difference. Yeah, they thought it was essentially in the way our bodies are structured. So I guess it's almost a continuation directly of the tests that were performed in America, which were backed by the, at the time, scientific basis that black people didn't really feel pain. So now it's continued and it's kind of manifest and it's insidious because if that goes unchecked, it just turns into the practice we are currently seeing and becoming more aware of. Yeah. And and I think that reminds me of the, in the 1800s, the kind of exoticism of the black body especially female bodies were kind of paraded around and seen as structurally different and that kind of angle of believing that you know black people have thicker skin in itself just seems ludicrous but as you say if people believe it you know we have to all educate ourselves and and spread the word that obviously this isn't science yeah it's to be it's something to be challenged but i think that's just it's when i think of medicine i think medicine's one of those things that people hold up so much so to challenge it almost seems like quite a big feat but if you don't know the context of where medical discoveries have come from or how they were brought about so you don't know any of this kind of stuff happened would make you less likely to challenge something because you think everything's been done by the book because we're thinking from a 
current perspective, not the perspective of how people would have thought back then. So I think things can be challenged very much so. So yeah, the education, as you said, is very useful for that. Yes, and in terms of um, medical school education, how have you found Black people's experiences and people's experiences of medicine represented in your teaching you've received throughout your time at medical school? I'm not going to lie, it's... I haven't, we didn't really get taught too much in terms of race difference in presentation. The main things we were kind of taught were black people are more likely to have certain conditions, sickle cell, blah, blah. But we weren't really thought, taught clinical manifestations of common diseases and the differences there. Like if you're worried about someone not having enough oxygen, you check for pallor. So make sure like, make sure they've got enough color in them. Like you look in the eyelids, you look in their mouth, but those color differences can be more subtle in people of different races. And there's quite a lot of, cause I've just got onto dermatology in this year. And there's a lot of emergencies, like really serious things. Like if you don't treat, someone will die quite quickly. And all the examples on the cases were on white people. It came as quite a shock to me and my colleagues when we finally saw the presentations on darker skin tones, like how easily missed they could be because we were just used to a completely different thing. As a black person myself, I'd know like if I get a bruise or if I have some swelling, I'd know the kind of skin differences, but most people would easily overlook it. So the fact that it wasn't really included in the normal education of the medics, I think it's just a kind of blind spot. You know, speaking about dermatology makes me think of the St. George's medical student this year who released a book mind the gap i said it's quite innovative of him i think it's it's just good that he recognized it and took the stand because i think whilst we're aware of it people of different races are coming up through the medical schools it wasn't really challenged but it's really good i think that he's gone and done that kind of brought it into the more public light because since then i've seen quite a lot on it like our some societies within our university hosted zoom events where they brought in specialists and they kind of talk through examples, show the photos. I'm pretty sure that I've had three, 500 people there. So now it's been brought into, into the forefront. It's people are providing the necessary education for the uni, which I think is useful. But I also think aside from dermatology, there's other things that this would be useful for, like clinical science which should have been started earlier. Yes, exactly. Learning dermatology and thinking about those serious diseases, for example, that you mentioned, where I assume you're talking about things like Steven Johnson syndrome. Um, So where someone could die and it's a kind of time critical illness. But also it should, we shouldn't just have to use those examples to get people to sit up and listen. It should be the whole range of dermatology. It should be eczema on darker skin and because that could have a huge impact on someone's life. Um, you know, not just those, those kind of life-threatening illnesses. It's something that everyone should take note of, should have taken note of earlier and made the required changes to the syllabus. But it, I don't, it, to me, it kind of, whether it strikes a little bit of worry as to the medical profession's awareness of this, of like the holes that they had in the education, whether it was permitting it to be too specialized. So when you go into the specialty, then you learn about it, which I think is a gap. But I think it should be anyone at any time, not just a black person who is more likely to have had a more personal relationship to a problem like this to take the stance. Essentially, changes like this should happen independent of race. Once you factor in that we are a diverse society, ever growing in its diversity in a ever globalizing world the necessity to educate the students coming through your medical school with the knowledge of how these conditions present in a multitude of skin tones is paramount it's something that should be top down it shouldn't be the other way around and it being the other way around shows that it's been missed for an overdue period of time However, I think that now the point has been raised by the student. The medical schools should do their utmost to essentially fill in these blanks, to accumulate the relevant information, the medical imaging when where necessary, to then provide examples to show their students and to prevent any continuation of this. And I think it almost then begs the question as to how much further afield do we look in terms of where we ha- we haven't considered racial diversity in its completeness. I think it sometimes also takes a, a tragedy to get people to sit up and listen. And I don't know if you heard about the case of, there was a young black woman in London who had COVID quite early on in the pan- pandemic and she phoned 
paramedics and they came and um, one of the things they commented on was the fact that her she wasn't blue so when someone's not got enough oxygen their extremities so their fingers and their lips might turn blue and it's something that paramedics are trained to look for but in black skin that looks different and very tragically she then went on to die at home um, because that had been missed and it, it still shocks me that something like that doesn't cause a huge outrage as you said we can hope that within medical schools they're starting to listen and I've definitely seen some efforts being made and you know journal publications about decolonizing the medical curricula which seems positive but moving obviously medical schools not just about sitting in lectures and being shown pictures so moving into kind of hospital medicine did you find um, a difference in your experience between the lecture theatre and being in the hospital when you came to learn clinical medicine? In which terms, actually? Well, I know that for most medical students, <laughs> it's daunting going into the hospital and you can feel a bit like a spare part. Um, and I was saying to Lily before this interview that um, I've personally been mistaken for a nurse a lot. I wondered if you'd been mistaken for any other members of staff and whether how much you thought that was down to being black or just looking a bit lost. To be fair, I don't know whether it's because we didn't wear scrubs, we wore quite formal stuff. I didn't it was more the feeling of being a spare part as with most students. However, other black students I know further afield, they experienced essentially being put into boxes very quickly. They were deemed to be aggressive. Not the first time I've heard that from friends I know who've gone off to medical schools. There's some clinicians. With patients, I've had a mixed review. I've, I haven't directly... Okay, all the patients will say the odd racist thing, just something that happens. But there's been cases which really surprised me. Medic I know had two cases of racism and they're black female and it was because the patient thought they were not a real doctor. That level of prejudice should not be happening currently. Like, And of course, you know, that student has to then go home and carry on studying and persevering and, you know, training to help other people but gets treated like that and I think the emotional intensity of that experience is probably brushed aside by other non-black colleagues who don't experience the same thing it is quite overlooked when stuff like that happens it's brushed aside it happens whatever but i think that might also be a reflection of the presence of black professionals at the upper part of the medical profession because from being in hospital i've seen the majority of black workers i see are at the cleaner hca and then the odd nurse level and very few doctors and consultants I've seen who are black. I think having their presence at the higher levels may change how easily the staff brush these things off or how much attention they pay to it because it's not necessarily the overt things that happen, it can also be the micros. In terms of thinking about that, representation matters and, and people, you know, people at the top not being white do you where do you see yourself and your career going are you hoping to be that beacon of light for other <laughs> medical students to inspire them I hope I am I hope I can be I hope I can be as I go through the medical school it's quite nice when we came when I came through a new society was formed for uh, Afro-Caribbean medics and it was just kind of like a support network to provide the help, provide the as in practical and emotional, I guess, support where needed for medical students coming through, which seems to have proved quite useful for the young years. And I think the kind of supportive mindset is also quite good. Because I know people come into med school and some med unis are quite competitive. People don't help each other. Everyone's out for themselves. And it's quite a lot to take on. It's quite a lot of emotional stress. So if you have that coupled with something like racial disparities and people not really understanding where you're coming from, and understanding you, it's quite difficult. So to have a little support network there, I think has helped them at that stage. And me, myself, when I go on to um, being a doctor and hopefully a surgeon, I think I'd want to look back with the prospect of being able to be aware of this, be able to help in any way as I see fit. If there's any systems I think should be challenged, it's what needs to be done. I'll speak to people who can make those changes or make the change myself where possible because I think that's the way making people aware making people able to help others and yeah, hopefully be that shining beacon as you said thank you very much for, for coming on the show that was Manny a final year medical student at Manchester chatting to me earlier this week I want to say a huge thank you to Manny for being our first interviewee on this show this year 
Before we hear from our guest Tayo, who excitingly joins me in the studio, let's have another song. It's R.E.S.P.E.C.T. by Aretha Franklin. That was R-E-S-P-E-C-T by Aretha Franklin. So I'm joined in the studio now by Tayo, who, like Manny, is also a medical student at Manchester. But Tayo is actually at Imperial this year, taking a degree in management. So I think in the studio, we're really representing the well-rounded medics of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Tayo, we've just heard my chat with Manny. Um, is there anything that struck you as ringing true to your experiences uh, as a black medical student or, or anything else that you've noticed in your time studying medicine? Um, I, I really liked the, the talk you had with Manny. Um, he made some really good points about the med- medical education in, in Manchester especially. Um, but I think it's, it, it's apl- applicable across the board. Um, I had a memory as soon as I heard him um, talking about kind of communication skills of in second year we have the skills lab where essentially you learn how to do examinations and talk to patients and take histories etc and um, they were talking about some of the signs that you might see in hypothyroidism I remember them saying um, peaches and cream and I was like you're gonna have a very hard time finding peaches and peaches and cream on my skin, um, that kind of thing. And I, there's all, all sorts of examples, so you know, flushing, just little things like cafe au lait, well, like those kind of things. Um, I'd always think to myself, I, I'm not sure if you'd find that. Like, what would that look like on me? Um, and that's where I thought, you know, Malone's book, uh, Mind the Gap, was 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 smashing because. A lot of black and minority ethnic, ethnic medics have had that kind of thought: is what would this look like on me, and how would I, how would I find this on a patient, say, who wasn't the typical textbook white patient? Um, so it's it's a really useful book, and I think he's done an amazing job there. Yeah, it, it's it is amazing. Um, he's Malone's book, which was which Manny spoke about. So that's mainly focusing on kind of dermatology so skin conditions skin illnesses and I think what's important for um, our listeners who might not be medics is to highlight the fact that when we're talking about these signs and 
peaches and cream and cafe au lait. I mean, it sounds quite funny, Mm. (laughs) but those are signs that really we are, are drilled into us and aren't just for, for skin conditions. They're for all sorts of conditions. And whenever you go and see a doctor, they are listening to your history, but also looking at you. Mm -hmm. And if they've had these things drilled into them and they don't see them, you know, they think they're recognizing certain patterns, but they're not. Mm. Um, and, and you mentioned um, other medical students with darker skin, probably, and defi- almost definitely feeling the same way, feeling like almost your skin type's excluded from this teaching. Mm. Um, do you consider this, would you go as far to say that is a kind of microaggression or a part of institutionalised racism? I'd, th- I'd, say, I'd say it's leaning towards more institutionalised. Um, it's... It's something that has been in place for so long. It's not something that we're going to come into and change immediately. Um, so, to to the extent where I've been, I've been in a GP practice. I think you mentioned eczema in in, in your interview previously. Um, I've been in a GP practice with a a white GP, um, and she was talking to me about her son, and he had papular eczema, I believe. Um, now, this is it's more common on you know mixed race and and darker skin types. And she's a GP, she's trained in, you know, she has some dermatological training to the point where she can she can pick up on her own child um, who's mixed race. Um, so it, that kind of, that kind of discrepancy and that kind of lack of recognition of, of these, of these conditions, it's, it's not something that's not, that's, that's like a problem now. It's something that's been in place for a long time to the point where, you know, Clinic clinicians can't find signs that you know are impacting their own children. So, it's mm. it's it's not. I wouldn't say it's a microaggression. I think the it's more of an institutionalized problem. It's something that we have to work towards fixing. And I think Malone's book goes a long way towards towards doing that. Um, but it has to it has to go a little bit higher. It has to go towards nice, and it has to go towards the the education of students across the board. Because you know if you can't you can't recognize a sign you can't if you, you can't treat it so you can only you can only kind of solve what you know um and we have to make sure that students from very early on i think first and second year should know what kind of signs look look like on on different skin tones yeah i, I think that's such a shocking story about that gp with you know her own child and i think infamously doctors aren't very good at mm. <laughs> picking up when their own children are unwell i'm sure you've encountered that in hospital too yeah. But, you know, I I think part of that story is because it's so unusual or or unbelievable almost, it would be amazing if if that GP, for example, came out and spoke about her experience publicly. And even every time that happens where, uh, you know, when you were talking about different conditions, lupus jumped to to my mind, being very common in, in black women. Um, and again, in medical school, it seems, feels like you're just taught about the rashes on white skin. Um, I mean, we could talk about the rashes forever mm. in, in all different conditions. But I think it's about admitting as well. Um, if, you know, if you're not black or if you, you, you know, as a white person, I can admit that I, it didn't, I didn't, it didn't cross my mind until I was in hospital about what different conditions would look like on different skin. Um, and that's being honest. And I've been lucky because I've trained in London where it's so multicultural and Mm. now I feel like I could, you know, confidently treat, know what I'm looking at, essentially, Mm. you know. But what worries me are the people who don't get that experience, aren't thrown into the deep end and Mm. and also the quality of that treatment. Mm. Can I truly give people, can somebody who's not encountered that truly give people a, a... balanced experience mm. uh, you know an equal healthcare opportunity yeah i think you're absolutely right i think it takes it takes a certain level of self-awareness because i myself had to admit that you know there were holes in my knowledge you know as as a black man i should i should you know i would expect myself to, to know these kind of signs but there were holes in my knowledge and it, i i too had to had to learn you know things that everyone had to and i think it was in the fallout of this of the Black Lives Matter movement, it kind of we had a rollover into medicine, and we were kind of examining um, outcomes and how we could equalize outcomes. I think you also mentioned about Manny also mentioned about the mortality in Black women and how you know it's, it's five times like uh, more likely for Black women to die 
uh, in pregnancy. Uh, they, I think they even equalized it for, they said it was more likely for a middle, middle age, middle class um, black woman to die in pregnancy than, than a lower class white woman. Um, so these kind of discrepancies are, are kind of in place, but it was all in that fallout that we, we had to kind of look at ourselves and say, where are the holes in our knowledge? What do we not know? Um, and how can we kind of fill these holes? Um, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to think of kind of why these outcomes are the way they are. Um, particularly for black women, I'd say in pregnancy, they kind of exist at this intersection of, of, of sexism and racism. And so it's, it's a very difficult hill to climb over. It's a very difficult thing for us to overcome, but we have to kind of acknowledge where our biases are. We have to acknowledge that, you know, women in general may not have their complaints taken seriously, and black women have, you know, on top of that, have racism of, of this strong black woman trope and this expectation that they should be able to handle pain. And that puts them already in a very, very difficult situation. That puts them at risk of of not having, you know, the successful pregnancy that is that should be standard, that should be that should be standard across the board. Absolutely not being taken seriously. Um, I was particularly struck, struck this year, I, just before COVID lockdown London, I attended um, the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, um, held a conference that was about race inequalities after the, this report came out about, um, as you said, black women being five times more likely to die in childbirth. And I think it was Asian women were twice as likely compared to white women as well. So it was kind of across the board of different ethnicities. And um, Dr. Christine Akechi, who leads, I believe, the um, task force for equality um, for the RCOG, spoke about her own experiences as a black woman um, in gynaecology. And she, I mean, she's a consultant gynaecologist and she felt like she wasn't listened to, she wasn't taken seriously. Wow. And I think that just kind of says it all. If, if there's a clinician in your own area, mm. um, it's it's really shocking. Mm. I think it's, yeah, it's again about, you know, looking at our holes and looking at where we're falling short. We have to, we have to assess it. And I think the NHS is starting to look at it and it's starting to take it very, very seriously. I think that it's, we're a long way away from these outcomes. I think in in 2019, there's, I think in the 2020 fallout, again, we still saw high profile, you know, women, Serena Williams and, and Beyonce complaining about kind of difficulties they had to go through um, with, with childbirth. And if, if at that high kind of profile woman and, you know, if they can afford, they can obviously afford the best care, but that is not the case for women, you know, living in, in you know, middle England. And so we have to have a standard. We have to have a standard that's, that's across the board and we have to make it equal for everyone. And that's, that, that's kind of the best outcome that we can hope for. And I can hear from your accent that you're not from Manchester, is no, that right? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm very Southern. I'm very Southern. <laughs> and um, so have you noticed any difference um, in terms of how black people are treated being up north versus being down south? Anything to reflect on there? Or is it difficult to say without having... It is difficult because I, I think living in London, you have a little bit of a protective multi-ethnic bubble around you. So, you know, if I was to, if I was to have any sort of racist abuse leveled towards me, I'd be, it comes as a little bit more of a shock. But, you know, in, in the northern part of England, in Manchester, um, we're also it's also very, I think, up there, to be fair. Uh, we also have a large Asian, um, you know, population, a large black population. It's when you start moving out towards, you know, the, the outer regions of the north that you might experience some sort of, some sort of, you know, racist abuse. But I, I personally haven't had any. Um, Luckily, in, in, in practice or in, you know, in general life, I think that uh, must be a very rare case because I know it happens to a lot of people. It happens to a lot of my friends. Um, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, I would personally not even acknowledge as abuse, but it's, it's things that, you know, people may not be able to handle and may, may not be able to cope with. Uh, people are different and, and we have to have a level where racist abuse it just isn't acceptable it, you know depending regardless of who's who it's leveled at 
Um, absolutely and, yeah. and especially you know in the NHS it's absolutely shockingly common um, you know even during my two years of working as a doctor mm. some of the things patients would say to staff who are, who are black it's just you, you know you wouldn't believe it and it's a heightened emotional state being mm-hmm. in hospital and for relatives but I just don't think it, excu- it excuses it and the problem is the more common it was in in one hospital I worked at, for example, the more it got excused Mm. um, because it's an effort for senior management to Mm. give a red card, for example. Um, But talking about management, is your your course you're doing this year, you're taking a management course, Mm. are you hoping to combine that with your healthcare interests or what what are your plans for the future? Yeah, so I'm I'm doing management this year. it was really more about the skills that I could I could pick up from this course. Um, so, for example, at this point, we're, we're, I'm doing a, an accounting module, which is cool. brand new to me. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's stuff that's, that's useful to me. You know, we're doing organizational behavior, learning about motivation. We had negotiation in the in the past few weeks, so it's it's more about what I can learn, the kind of skills that I can apply to future situations that I can combine medicine and these kind of skills that I've picked up. To kind of you know put myself in, in a good position and put myself in a position where I can take advantage of situations that come that come in front of me. Amazing. I mean, it, it's such as you said, <laughs> the accountancy. I mean, that would be totally <laughs> alien to me. Very different. Very very different. <laughs> very different from medical school. Yep. <laughs> so if there was just we're wrapping up now. So I was just wondering if there was one thing you'd like your colleagues to know, regardless of race about your experiences of, of medical school and experiences of maybe colleagues that you've heard about as a as a black person, what would you want that to be? We're all doing the same job and it should be exactly, it, it's a difficult job in itself, but it should be the same level of difficulty for all of us. It should, it should be easy for us to go to work. It sh- we shouldn't have to deal with these kind of microaggressions. So I think if you see it, you should have the feeling that this isn't right and you should be actively looking to call that thing out, call the racism out or call out any sort of abuse or any sort of discrimination you see out. You shouldn't be sitting quietly and saying that's not right in the in the staff room afterwards isn't isn't good enough. You have to be there at the point where it's happening and saying, yo, this is this is absolutely unacceptable. We can't have that kind of kind of behaviour around in, in this environment that that we're trying to create. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's kind of what I would I would say to any kind of professional is is to see it and, and do something about it at the point where it's happening. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tayo. Um, best of luck with your studies, Absolutely. and um, I'm sure you'll be back in Manchester freezing cold <laughs> sooner than you can realise. Trying to avoid it. <laughs> okay, then. So we'll have another tune now. This is "History Repeating" by Shirley Bassey. Something evolving Wherever may come The world keeps revolving They say the next big thing is here That the revolution's near But to me it seems quite clear That it's all just a little bit of history repeating Good. 
the pain, feel the joy. And sidestep the little bits of history repeating. That was History Repeating by Shirley Bassey. So we've heard from Manny and Tayo, um, but what is Black History Month? We keep banding the word around, the words around this evening, but I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background. So this was first celebrated in the UK in London in 1987, when um, Ghanaian analyst Akiaba Adai Sebo, who worked with the London Mayor Ken Livingstone at the Greater London Council, as coordinator of special projects, wanted to celebrate black history in the UK, and that's when it, it started. So just to finish off the show, Lily and I wanted to quickly reflect on the relevance of black history in both of our fields, uh, medicine and archeology. span um, We've unintentionally found ourselves in my realm today because both of our guests were from medical backgrounds. But nonetheless, the significance and contributions of black people and black clinicians in medicine could be spoken about for hours, far more than we can cover in the show today. And something that we wanted to mention whilst we were on air is that this episode isn't a one-off. We're not just going to nod at Black History uh, Month today and leave it. Throughout the year, we're hoping to cover lots of different um, ethnicities, contributions to science as we, as we go through the year. Um, there are plenty of negative aspects of black history in medicine, which we've definitely heard about today. But I just wanted to mention a couple of black people from the UK who I think should be celebrated. So Mary Seacole, you might have heard of her name before. She was born in 1805. She was a British Jamaican nurse um, and is known for her medical work in the Crimean War. She also overcame many racial prejudices she experienced in her lifetime. Um, and I feel a bit of a personal connection with her because several of the hospitals I've trained and worked in have had wards and buildings named after her and I believe there is a statue of her actually outside St Thomas's uh, Hospital as well which is you know a very apt place for her. The other person I wanted to mention was Harold Moody who was a doctor and activist um, he began his own practice in South London in 1913 he became well known for leading the first black pressure group in the UK. This was called the League of Coloured Peoples. His fight for the welfare of black people and to end discrimination in employment and public places was hugely influential. And I think it's interesting because often um, doctors are seen as not very political um, and this man was incredibly political and influential. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that I love the concept of black history being made currently. So um, when I was reading about some of the, these influential people, I came across um, Professor Laura Serrant, OBE. Um, she's been named one of the UK's most influential black people. And she's been a nurse for over 35 years, specialising in sexual and reproductive health, tackling social attitudes to HIV and AIDS, and acting as a strong advocate for racial equality. 
chairing the Chief Nursing Office for England's Black and Ethnic Minority Strategic Advisory Group and advising on BAME issues for the government. She was awarded an OBE in 2018. And whilst I was researching her, um, I found that there's a BBC4 documentary called Black Nurses, The Women Who Saved the NHS. Um, So I'm planning to check that out. I recommend you do too, and you, Lily, um, because I just think... um, Having worked in the NHS, I couldn't read a more true statement. Black nurses, the women who saved the NHS. So over to you, Lily. What's the significance of of black history in in archaeology? Yeah, so archaeology has a pretty racist background, as I'm sure everyone knows from the British Museum, stealing every other country's goods. But despite all of this, despite all the obstacles, there are some very cool figures that I think we should have been talking about, even in my degree, I realised every single archaeologist we were were taught about was white and European. There was no diversity. So it's time to rectify this. (laughs) So John Wesley Gilbert was born in 1863 in the USA in Georgia. He was one of the first black Americans to attend Brown University and graduate from it. In fact, he was one of the first black people to graduate from any North American uh, university. Wow. To put this in context, Brown University is an Ivy League uh, college, which is the equivalent to R. Russell Group, so very, very prestigious. He then got a scholarship um, to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, where he was also the first black person to ever attend. He was given an award for his excellence in Greek and excavated the site of, um, I think it was like Atrishia. In mm. fact, he was like the one who found the pillars, the Whoa. walls, and the gates, which then led to the city's uh, like discovery of its location, which was he then helped map as well. Um, his work in Greece got him a master's from Brown University, where he was, surprisingly, again, the first black person to receive an advanced degree. So he was really breaking some boundaries. Yeah, definitely. Um, when he got back to his home state of Georgia, he became a teacher at his former, um, one of his former colleges, where he, who was also the first black t- teacher to ever work there. Um, and he was a professor in Greek, Latin, French, German and Hebrew. So not only was he an archaeologist, he was an incredible linguist as well. And and you didn't hear about him at all during your studies? Nope, nope, oh. none. Um, currently, there is Rachel um, Watkins, who is a professor of anthropology at the American University in Washington, D.C. So she's essentially an osteoarchaeologist, which I like to hear. <laughs> uh, she's been working on a skeletal collection, which comprises, from what I believe of, the remains of some of the city's former black residents from 1930 to 1969. Mm. She's been collecting data on the effects of poverty and various like biocultural factors and comparing this data with research from its living residents. And I imagine, sadly, there's still some effects of poverty um, to be seen in the living residents as well. Yeah, I think this is very much a sad comparison mm. that is still very prevalent. Her other research um, also focuses on how black people both in like academ- academia and research and also as subjects of research and anthropology are viewed and treated. So despite archaeology being so diverse in the cultures that are studied, non-white POC from those cultures are still vastly underrepresented as researchers, which is what her work is aiming to address. She's putting, she's pushing for black feminist theory and critique of science to be used more to address this disparity in, um, in the field and fight against the prevailing ideal that, um, that, that like the ideal intelligent person is white, male, cisgendered and straight. I think that's something that we can all get behind. They um, can. So it's fantastic to, to think about these people and, and celebrate them and keep their names in our minds as we, as we look back at black history. And as I said before, we're planning this year to, to keep this theme going as, as much as we can. I mean... I know I certainly want to speak about reproductive justice uh, justice issues, which are definitely w- w- was a movement created by black women specifically. So um, we will be continuing this theme. Bear with us. Just before we close the show, I'll um, shout out to Gareth. Thank you for listening. Scarlett, thank you as well. And Jay, and if next week you want your name to be shouted out on the radio, make sure you listen live 6pm at the YouTube link. So thanks for joining us today. Hopefully we've left you plenty to reflect on. 
Next week, we will be discussing all things spooky as Halloween is just around the corner. I hope you're aware and haven't forgotten because of COVID. So don't put your skeletons away after the 31st. We'll be expecting you to have them hanging out with us on Monday. We'll see you then. Same time, same place. Got science, we got maths, you're staying up to class.